Jonah came off his wing, got the ball off the nine and just eyeballed me. I'm like, anyway, steamrolled me. Um, I felt exactly like Mike Cat felt in uh, 95. Uh, certainly in 03, we had that unshakable belief. I mean, the final, we didn't play well in the tournament, really. You see these guys, yeah. There's only one referee. It feels like there's three. And Gregan chirped up, he says, yeah, and you're not in the top three, mate. <laughs> Welcome to the penultimate pod in Paris. This is the official Rugby World Cup pod brought to you by Asahi Superdry, the official beer of the Rugby World Cup. And on the show today, three men who know what it's like to lift the Webb Ellis Cup. That's ex-Springbok captain, John Smith, the top scorer of all time, Dan Carter, and Austin Healy's best friend, Ben <laughs> Kay. Gents, welcome. Welcome to Paris. You can just about That's see libelous, you. by the way. Oh, is it? Yeah, you can't call Do it Do I need that. to start again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you. Uh, you've been there, you've done that. Uh, anyone who's been on this pod from the start has not predicted anything right during this World Cup. Be honest, did you see a New Zealand, South Africa final, John Smith? I did call it a few months ago. Did you though? But I was, it's biased because I had to be brave on, on our side of the draw and go with South Africa. And it seemed pretty obvious on the other side for me. Well, congratulations, you're the first person to get it right. But, uh, but before we get there, now, isn't it? before I'm we get there, <laughs> I quite laughed your intro. I mean, I've never had top point scorer after my name. And then... <laughs> and then <laughs> I'll be honest, I thought Dan was sitting there. <laughs> yeah, okay. He sat in the wrong spot, so I might sense. have got that it confused. That makes sense. Dan, did you predict this? I would love to say that I predicted it. Honesty, finally, John. Yes, see that exactly. honest man next to you. I, I mean, see. a couple of powerhouses of world rugby, but before the World Cup, you know, the consistency of a violent... France and then obviously after the, the opening game and you know the, the way the, the French mm. played against the All Blacks you know I, I knew that you know, I've been lucky enough to work a little bit with the All Blacks this year and, and seen the growth and the, and the work and how much it means to them I, I knew that they were going to improve from that opening game um, but yeah for some reason I just yeah I was, uh, was convinced that, that Ireland or France... Made uh, the World Cup open, didn't it? Like, I always knew that this was going to be the most hotly contested, uh, you know, Rugby World Cup of all time. And and unfortunately, I've, I've been on the end of a you know, couple of World Cup uh, playoff losses, uh, going into the tournament as favourites. And I, I knew just because, you know, like Ireland and France were going in as favourites doesn't guarantee uh, success. And, and that's the, the beauty of the game, the beauty of the competition is, you know, there are no guarantees. And um, But, yeah, what, what a tournament it's been. I, I thought France would get there. Just I, did you? I was going to say, having, could have been New Zealand, oh, England. Look, so I, I mean, commentated on uh, England, France uh, at the Stade de France back, what, just under two years ago. The atmosphere, it was almost like a procession that day. England were just part of the script. The, the French public so believed in their team. It's the first time I've seen the French public so connected to their team. Like we, we played in 07 in the semi final and we were underdogs going in. But at 60 minutes, there was a bit of booing in the crowd and we knew we had them because the crowd had turned on their own team. And the, the French had just been so behind, you know, Anton Dupont as, as that talismanic leader. So I was convinced they were going to get there. New Zealand, I thought, might do, because like I've done a, a couple of radio interviews in New Zealand during the World Cup, and I've never had that from the New Zealand sort of fans and public before, that they were like, oh, this is the worst All Blacks team there's ever been. And, and, and I'm like, usually it's the opposite. You're having to keep their feet on the ground and say, yeah, you're good, but... You know, there's a chance you might, no, no, we're definitely going to win. Everyone was saying, no, this is awful, this is awful. And you could just see that as soon as the belief started to come back, that, you know, yeah. they were a good side, they were going to be very difficult to beat. So I, I did sort of think that New Zealand might get there, but I was co convinced it was going to be the French. But as per usual, South Africa turned well, up yeah, and do it. It could have easily been in New Zealand. England final in, in the end. Well, I, we, yeah, I, I, that, that been probably great. not sitting on that sofa because, you know, my, my pecking order, <laughs> yeah, but the yeah, just I might have got you, on the if, final sofa. If you listen to this, not watching, we've got the finalists yeah. on the sofa and Ben's kind of on a third seat <laughs> on his own. Third and fourth Different balcony. Yeah. Over there. <laughs> <laughs> but it could have so easily been, you know, with what, Look, 15 minutes to go. Unbelievable form. I did say before the game, the last thing England want to be is two points down with less than 10 minutes to go really? because holding on to that was always going to be a challenge. Oh, I, I sort of right. felt if they'd been two points down themselves rather than South Africa um, chasing, I think England might have got over the line, but the scrum and, and the bomb squad coming on just 
changed everything. England were so good in terms of where they've been pre-World Cup, what they needed to do against South Africa. They played it tactically perfect, but they just couldn't cope at the end. And I, I still haven't seen an angle where I'm convinced that rock, that last Here scrum we call go. was right. No, no, I just, let it go. Ben. But the work was done by the previous scrums because it was so obvious yeah. how how on top South Africa were. If there was going to be a 50-50 call, the referee's always going to go, well, I think that South Africa are on top. Bit of a jailbreaker. Mm. Sort of two weeks in a row. Um, Victor and I walked, the French came, we walked down after, with three minutes ago, and we were like, it's, it's, we're done. And so we walked down and, and Yevon scored the try and we we're like, okay, this week we started the game. We're like, whatever we do, we're going to walk down at 20 minutes. When we walked down at 20 minutes, the game was gone, 15-6. Yeah. And we were in a far deeper hole than we were the week before. And yeah, that was, that was England played it perfectly. I mean, the conditions, the kicking game, everything. And then it just... You, you've yeah. got to admire Razzie as well because, and uh, Nivenar because so early commit to the fact that you've got the tactics wrong or it's not working and go, if we don't do something now, we're not going to win this game. Yeah, and also, he was he, he should have gone 6-2 and he should have started with Pollard, but he didn't yeah. and he quickly realised that, that things were that, going hairy. That was brutal. Yeah, it is brutal. And that's the cruel thing about sport. <laughs> Lubbock gets subbed at 30. It's, he's he's going to take some recovery. And I saw Jacques talking about the fact that they've done it before. And they did. They did it with Bongi in yeah. 2019 and you know he was just off and they... they, they just scratched him early. Um, but it does hurt. It hurts the player's mental mental side. Well, we're, we're saying it with the benefit of hindsight. 25 minutes to go, they've used all their bench. Mm -hmm. so if they have a, someone breaks their leg or has a serious injury, you're stuffed. So they've gone all in and, and just back themselves. And, and if they've got that wrong, we're, we've got the benefit of hindsight that they won the game. If England had gone on and won easily, everyone would have gone, imagine... Using well, all your subs, it. what were they yeah. thinking? Yeah. But they've backed themselves and they, they've come up with a World Cup final. High level sport. As a fly off, Dan, what did you make of that substitution after half hour? Has that ever happened to you? I can't imagine that's <laughs> ever happened to you at any level in um, your life. Not to me, but I've seen, I've seen it happen, you know, in, in big games uh, when there is, there is momentum, uh, completely one sided, and, and you need to. To be brave and, and, and make uh, big decisions and that's something that Russie's talked about is, is the strength uh, off the bench and substitutions that can come on and, and make a real impact and, and they needed something because you could see uh, how much the English uh, wanted it in that first half. They were right up for that, they, they had all the momentum and, and they needed uh, someone uh, that would be calm and really clear and really decisive uh, in a big game with, with World Cup experience and, and, and uh, I think that's why they had uh, Pollard on the bench, uh, whether he's on the bench this week, I, highly unlikely. But just to have that that depth and um, and that control, but you know, I, I agree. You know, it's, it's pretty tough uh, one to take for for Libert, but he's a fantastic player. He has been good in, in different in different good. conditions. You know, if it's a dry conditions and the game's going to be but, a bit but more why open. Not start with Pollard then. That's, as a as a fan, I was thinking. Yeah, it's, I, you know, need to get Russi on on the podcast, sure. uh, but. You know, obviously he's uh, you know got his, his opinions and, and knew if things weren't going well, then then he could Not he could make that change. substitution. It'll be the, the interesting thing this week. That, you know, up against uh, an All Black side that want to play with the ball more. The game I think will be a lot more open than uh, the, the game was last That's night. So. <laughs> just, well, just, just on that, yeah, because a couple of months ago in Swickenham, um, South Africa turned over New Zealand quite easily in in the end. The box starts. He doesn't miss a goal. He doesn't miss a beat that day. So if it is decent weather in Paris next weekend, who do you start at 10? It's going to be crucial for... South yeah, I, up until you know last night, I would have said uh, yeah. you know, a little bit, but I, th I think that the, 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 the pressure, the experience of, of Pollard on such a big occasion, you know, the, the hurt that he and the learnings that he had from 2015 and you know, being on both sides of you know successful and unsuccessful World Cup campaigns, you know, really is is going to you know play a, a key part in, in having that experience you know, out there right from from the get go. But you know, just on that with a lot though, that we all talk. And Dan will tell you the ten is the most important person on the field. Right? We we know <coughs> we know it's the forwards, right? <laughs> because everyone's been saying, oh, should England put Owen Farrell in, George Ford, Marcus Smith at ten? Doesn't matter if your forward pack don't give you the platform. And yeah. Lebok is a, uh, that day in Twickenham. South Africa completely dominated up front. A 10's always going to look better. Whereas yesterday, 
they were struggling to get that physical dominance and Le Boc str struggled early on, particularly with the weather. You probably want a 10 to come on like mm. Pollard in, in that circumstance. So if South Africa get dominance, they want Le Boc playing. So it's, it's, it's and the other challenge. thing that you can with absolute certainty know is that no one in the world can predict what Russ is going to do next. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been trying to figure it out for five years. He's just, he's always thinking in a different way. And I, and I, and I can tell you right now, that don't be surprised if you see Lubbock starting because the yeah. weather's going to be or good. Kits off because we, we're going to have to play. <laughs> so yeah. he, that's, we've been trying to figure it out for five years, but he's always got some kind of plan and with anything you know for sure is that you have got no clue what he's going <laughs> to yeah. do next. He's, he's fascinated, isn't he? Even before this yeah. game, he sits down, he's on Twitter, goes on Twitter, got a few minutes to myself, so I thought I'd respond to a few people. <laughs> and then goes sort of after that QE journalist yeah. calling him or her, apparently it was a typo, we don't know. Does he do this <laughs> kind of stuff? I told you, you've got no certainty. Yeah, but does he do, what, why, is, is there a, is there a yeah, strategy but, behind this behaviour? Look, I think one thing that I, that you do uh, know about Rassi is that everything he, he is he's, he's a smart guy you know I've, 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 I've played with him and he's I've never met a guy that knows the game and understands the game and, and studies the game well I mean there's a great story about him when he was playing under Nick Mallett well, those back in the days when the coach's job was okay come on together boys okay we're gonna do it you know go harder and it was there's no real sort of technical anal analyzing of the game and it was in the days of the, the VHS recorder and so he and there was a company I think in the UK that had a a, 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 a VHS machine with two videotapes and a, some analyzing machine and Rassi bought it for himself while playing for the Springboks and then started doing analysis and giving Nick feedback as the coach and saying well I've been through uh, the the tapes and the and that's how he started as a player he started analyzing the game for the first time finding tech that could that keep, keep the sort of the detail and bring stats into it and so everything and everything he does is for a reason mm. there's nothing that happens by accident so that, so is it detail is it experience 2003 you found a way to win that side 18 months before the world cup south africa new zealand they find a way to win so the impossible and the impossible question is how how do you find how, what is it what is it that means ah. you know that was the difference last night. It was the difference. Think, France, South Africa, yeah. New Zealand, France. What what is it? I think there's two levels to that question. There's the sort of this the sort of springback mentality, which is is quite a it's there's a, there's a lot of passion and and uh, love for the game, and also there's a responsibility on on a springback team for what it does back home uh, that supersedes the game. And then there's this team and what they've become over the last five years. So, so and you go back for five and a half years when they started with, with Rossi as the coach. Um, ranked seventh in the world, tough times. You know, and the Springboks were not a, a popular team and, and they're the only team that sort of bring hope. And they resurrected this, and the plan was to try and win this World Cup. In 2019, then they obviously managed to win 2019, but this team has gone from being seventh in the world, no hopers, to getting a coaching staff that have turned them into something substantial, grown together as a team, gone from being teammates to mates, gone from having girlfriends to wives to kids and galvanizing as a group that literally puts them in this bubble that makes them even more resilient. So they sort of look for moments like this. They thrive on it. You can just see the one, one thing that probably makes me the proudest of this team is that they've lost some tests, but they've never lost a test without putting everything on line. There's always like life and death effort. And that's, I think, what differentiates them at the moment. It's just, it's just never, ever over. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, so, I'm ready to play in the final. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was going to cry. So I was, oh, was no. going to run at you then, man. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> uh, you can see uh, it, though. The South Africans are playing for something much bigger than themselves. And that can often you know, be the difference of getting themselves out of those situations. Uh, for me, it was always just self-belief. You know, you're down by two tries, there's six minutes left on the clock. You know, as an all-black, we we believed that, that we could score those those two tries. You know, not once did you see, you know, the guys with their heads down or, a, you know, give up me mentality. It's, um, and, and a lot of that comes down to, to mindset, experience and, and mindset. So actually working with your psychologists uh, around being able to perform under pressure. So you're down on the scoreboard uh, like the, the box were last night and how to stay really sort of clear and decisive and incredible decision-making 
in those last 10 minutes when you've got all this, the world uh, of mm. rugby watching you and being able to execute uh, in those situations. Um, so a lot of sort of mental strength comes uh, into into that and that self-belief. You know, you, you look at the, the, the French game, uh, the quarterfinal, you know, the last 10 minutes, uh, you know, you have uh, Ramos sort of kicking the ball out of the touch, uh, uh, Mathieu Joubert kicking the ball in the penalty backwards, just simple skills are uh, performed under pressure is uh, a lot around sort of not being in the, those moments before and, and not having that uh, that experience, uh, but also not being able to, you know, control your sort of mind, being able to perform and, and execute a uh, simple task uh, under pressure. And, and that's exactly what happens, uh, you know, come uh, World Cup playoff time. And then when we, when you become a senior player in that, in that group, is it your responsibility to pass that on? Like Pollard was amazing in watching him live. He was telling people what to do before he kicked to touch everyone was so clear it seemed they were clear what they were doing so that'd be your responsibility then to give everyone else the feeling that this is okay we can do this and and you've got to learn from uh you know from from experience and and also sort of working on that so you know pollard is a very different player to, to what he was in 2015. you know i remember our semi-final playing up against him he's this young young talent and you know the the box were playing extremely well that day and in similar conditions to last night but i always felt like we we just had this sense of of control we were calm we were clear we wanted to be in those high pressure situations and uh, the learnings that he would have got from a World Cup like that is you know, I think the big part of the reason that he's elevated his game he wants to be in those high pressure situations he's the guy that uh, the box you know looked to in, in that last 10 minutes of, of a playoff game so that that experience goes a long way mm. no, I, you, I damn much belief that that's what it is and like it's very difficult you know from an England perspective when the belief hasn't been there to suddenly turn it on it's got to be unshakable because when everything's going well, that's fine. And we all remember, you know, remember the great All Black sides, great Springbok sides for, for when it was going well. But actually what probably got them to the final is when they played and they weren't playing well. You know, you plan a, a World Cup's a four-year cycle and the detail of planning that every coaching staff will have done. But actually it's probably one on the fact, you know, what was the Mike Tyson quote? Everyone's got to plan till they get punched in the mouth. And, <laughs> and it's how you react to that that's, that's, that's important. And uh, certainly in 03, we had that unshakable belief. I mean, the final, we didn't play well in the tournament, really. Maybe the French game, we, we were good in the semi-final, but the, 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 the World Cup final, you know, everyone remembers Johnny as the greatest ever kicker. He probably missed the most kicks he'd, he'd ever done. You know, some idiot drops the ball over the line. Mm. You've got... Did you ever think of it? Don't often think about that. No one ever reminds me of no. it, to be honest. <laughs> um, no, like, didn't you know, matter any of it, did it? Even so. French kids, six yeah. years old, you know, oh, you're the guy that dropped the ball. Yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, gave away loads of silly penalties. You know, the scrum that was a, was a strength of ours um, was penalised. But you have to find a way of getting it done. You can only do that if you completely believe. And, and last night, actually, the the South Africans, you know, that they, they were in a dark, dark hole. And I, I think probably the South African mentality you were, you were alluding to makes them the ultimate knockout rugby team because even when they're in the worst possible shape, they'll find a way to get it done. 2007, you know, Mark Cueto scores that try over and goes, oh, if if, Kuwait, if that had been given, you, you would have won the final. I still think South Africa had that belief that they might have found a way to come back and turn that over anyway. You know, you it's talk, just... You talk about the dark hole and, and Dan mentioned about pressure, but that's that's where you sort of, you, you have to learn and get your experience. I mean, it's always, and we sort of love that. I love that about the game because there's games and there's games. There's games that have got pressure and then when you go into that dark hole, it's being a dark room. It's the teams that figure out quickly how to get to the light switch. Yeah. And most teams, when they get into the dark room, they start slapping the wall all over the place. Sounds like a night out with you. <laughs> <laughs> but you've just got to go inch by inch. You've got to work, yeah. work your way through it till you get, and you've got to cover every single inch. And that is where good teams you know, come in. And it, it, to get into that space of being calm when it's dark and finding the light switch, you've got to have tasted some bitter moments. We made a massive thing about every test match that, that, that we lost, because it, it bites, you don't like losing test matches. But we'd always talk about how it felt yeah. in processing that emotional feeling so we could bottle it and understand where we don't want to go in the future. Mm. Most great teams have lost games as well on mm. the way, you know, you, and actually the majority of the coaches that have won a World Cup uh, have been there and, and seen what it's like not to win one and learned from that. Mm. Martin Johnson always used to say, you know, the grand slams that we didn't win before winning the World Cup were like the scars 
that you remind you on the pitch and mm. of what Makes you've been through and, and what you need to do differently. Well, so you, you mentioned that this South Africa group has been together, what, five and a half years, and mm. uh, Razi Borthwick was saying it's been pretty much four months, so many young players in the squad. And one of my favourite quotes on, on, the, on the pod was a couple of weeks ago, Andrew Mertens was on saying, um, Steve Hansen said that playing a third and fourth place playoff is a bit like <laughs> an open mouth kiss with your grandmother. <laughs> No one wants it. It's a thing in YouTube, like, is it? <laughs> no, one, no one wants that play. Uh, uh, That's going to be brutal, isn't it? After the emotion. Yeah. Not as brutal as trying to get rid of their thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but actually, and then Francois, Francois Lowe was saying, it's been such an emotional couple of weeks for South Africa. From a New Zealand point of view, extra day, how much of a difference does that make in, in modern rugby? And after Argentina, seven tries didn't seem that much of a, a challenge in the end. So where do you think the All Blacks are this week? Yeah, I think that an extra day, you know, will help a way just to be able to get away from the game. You know, when you've been together for over two months, um, the pressures of, of playing in uh, World Cup uh, playoff games, the, you know, the world looking at you, the fact that you've been in camp um, for a long period of time, they just need to get away from the game to, to really switch off. So that extra day um, will, you know, will, will really help them just to go spend some time with their families, come into Paris, uh, see the children, a lot of families over here for them at the moment before they, they um, you know, push the, the reset button. So it's a, it's a huge challenge for the All Blacks uh, this year because, you know, we, we've talked about you know, the, the, the great teams, they just know, know how to win. Um, but, you know, in the last three years, the, the All Blacks haven't had that consistency that, um, you know, that we've known from them. Um, but they've turned things around. They've, they've put in two good performances in a row. Now they're, they're up against a, a brutal team. But they're, uh, the they're on the way up, though. That, that's the key. They've got that. And when you've been in some dark places, actually, when it starts to go good again, it, it tends to snowball a bit quicker. Momentum. And South Africa, they've had two tight games where you could potentially say they're holding on at the end. And, and they were very much ahead of New Zealand going into the tournament, I think, as, as potential yeah. favourites. But they're sort of starting to just tip over the hill a little bit and, and the All Blacks are coming up. So... God, it's going to be fascinating. And oh. the, the thing about the All Blacks as well, from a South Africa point of view, is they could play, South Africa could play the perfect 70, 75 minutes. But in those five minutes, the All Blacks could create and vice three versa. or four chances. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, that's what, exactly what happened um, against Ireland. You know, Ireland yeah. controlled the ball for long periods of time. Um, a couple of quick plays from the All Blacks and, and you know, they can, you know, cause some damage by scoring uh, quick points. Uh, you know, the, the fact that the Springboks and All Blacks know each other so well, uh, you know, two dominant um, powerhouses of the world rugby is really going to make it a, a huge uh, matchup. We know what what's coming, um, but how do you nullify that? Um, you know, they'll have uh, some strategies <laughs> around that, but it's it really does make for a you know an incredible you know World Cup final. I know the ones you know we're often the All Blacks going into you know tournaments as favourites, one of the favourites, and this is probably one of the the first times mm. that they haven't, mm. and I think I've enjoyed that. You know, actually proving people wrong. Like you talked about the, the the conversations that have been happening in New Zealand. Not many um, Kiwis thought that you know would be in a, in a final and with a you know good chance of of uh, winning the World Cup uh, a few months ago. Um, so I know you, the All Blacks use that as, as inspiration to to prove people wrong, but also to make people proud. You know, we talk a lot about the the legacy of of the All Blacks, the legacy of the, the black jersey and, you know, what a way to, to enhance uh, the legacy than, than go on to, to win a fourth World Cup. A uh, part of, uh, I suppose, the criticism maybe, or uh, the, the, the negative thinking around the All Blacks uh, has, has been aimed at Ian Foster quite a bit as well. I mean, he was apparently sat there eating his popcorn watching <laughs> England South Africa last night, didn't care who he gets in the final. A word on him, like he's, he's had to stay pretty strong and it seems like the team have yeah, it's, for him. It's, it's been a challenging, you know, couple of years for uh, for Ian Foster, and you know, just the uncertainty of his job. Um, you know, that the players really got him got him behind him. Um, you know, just over twelve months ago, and and then obviously knowing that you know he's he's not continuing as the, the head coach after this World Cup. So you can go you can go one or two ways. When going gets tough, you got that in your mind. Well, you know, I'm not here next year. How much do I really want it? Or you can go the other way and you can really galvanise the group. So it's not just in Foster. There's a large part of that management that have been there for, for 20 years. Um, you know, physios, um, you know, strength and conditioning coaches, um, 
you know, uh, the psychologist and, and the team, uh, Gilbert and Aker, they're not part of the, the, the group next year. From what I've seen, they've galvanised. They've gone, um, you know, a really sort of exciting, right, this is it, this is a huge opportunity for us, let's prove, um, you know, the, the doubt is uh, wrong and, you know, let's let's come together and, and do something pretty special and, and they're on the verge of doing that. But, you know, in sport, there's, there's no guarantees. You, you were just talking there earlier about the, the difference, maybe 75 minutes, you know, one person, one thing can change a game. I suppose one of the players that's just come to my mind is Will Jordan. So eight World Cup tries, joint. Should have been nine. Should have been nine. <laughs> if only. Oh, my God. Oh, Richard. So I think Tell them about the time, interview. every the time interview, the All Blacks brilliant. have been in the red zone of the 22, they'd scored until the final play. And Richie Moanga, two on one. Will Jordan outside him. He shows and goes himself. And ITV interviewed him afterwards and, and initially said, him, what about Will Jordan? He's a oh, great player, great player. He said, you had a chance there to sort of write him into the history books. He went, yeah, he's a young kid. Need to keep his feet on the ground. I, I took one for the team. <laughs> He's going to have to earn it the Brian, hard way. Brian Bennett was that. cheering all the way. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you you got to keep been. Will hungry. You got to keep Will hungry. Yeah. He's yeah. young. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. now he has to score a try in the final. It's like you know, can't have how badly do you want it? I can't so, believe so, so that. Sort of says, oh, I know. It was definitely on, wasn't it? Oh, definitely on. I was. Yeah. I was. Uh, well, Kieran Reed was just behind me. I told all my mates obviously that I was at the game with Kieran Reed, but little do they know he was just behind me. And every time Will Jordan got the ball, he literally would stand up and shout, "See ya." Because uh, he thinks he's that. He's he that is good. that good. He is. He's a special talent. At his first World Cup and then to perform like he has, we, we always knew what he is, is capable of. Whether he's fullback yeah, or where will he end up? He'll probably end up at fullback. Um, at, at some stage, he's, he's still young. That's his preferred position. But he's just so talented. He's just got this amazing ability to to read the game. And he's one of those players that wherever the ball is, um, he'll be there. You know the fact. He's you know right wing and he's scoring tries on the left wing mm. and he can um, play anywhere. Really. Yeah, and he's just got this great um, you know cohesion with uh, Richie Mawanga. They've got a great little combination from from spending plenty of time with the Crusaders together. So he's been a, a standout player you know, for us. And, and you need those finishers in a big tournament like that. You need guys that from, know from how anywhere to as well. I mean yeah. that try off yeah. was it Sevilla inside his own twenty two. Yeah. I think that usually All Blacks are famous for supporting other players. They all look like, this is done. Yeah. yeah I generally, oh, like, he'll finish he's a freak. this. He's an absolute freak and a, a real talent. So I'm glad he's uh, able to to get the, the game time that he has because he had a bit of an injury concern at the um, the end of last mm. year and didn't play a lot for the Crusaders this year. But through the, the medical team, they've, they've got him right at the right time. Would you have given that pass to him? I quite like Richie's uh, comment, to be honest. But, uh, <laughs> I can tell you what, I'll be, I'll be the first person, if I was in Richie's uh, case, to, to go get him a beer straight after the game and apologise. <laughs> I can assure you that. I'm sure it would have been forgiven. He's in the final. <laughs> uh, you, you touched on it. South Africa and New Zealand um, know each other so well. The rivalry, what, what is it? What's, what's so magical, epic, brutal about it? Yeah, for Springboks, a, um, you sort of get two... Two debuts, sort of your first game for the Springboks, and then your first game against the All Blacks. <laughs> that's that how it works. I think it's it is the history um, that's that goes back over 100 years, or whatever. and and it's sort of where you want to be tested. You know, I always get guys that came with their first test against the All Blacks. They get a bit nervous about the hockey and they don't understand it, and it's, uh, so ask, what do you think? So the, the best message about facing the All Blacks and facing the hockey is that you've been able to get into that green and gold jersey and play against what we believe is our, our greatest opponent. They always bring out the best in us. They always test us them more than anyone else. And um, and we were joking about it earlier, but I mean, yeah, the most yeah, you, it's brutal. The test matches are brutal. And yet, w w whether we're in New Zealand or in South Africa, 20 minutes, half an hour after the game, we're sitting down having a beer together. And uh, and I think that's this sort of respect around the history of the game. So. It's it's is something special. I'm just I'm looking at Dan smiling because you said earlier that you were a bit shocked when you first placed, played the Springboks. Oh, you just for 80 minutes they wanted to kill you, and then they're like, "Why are you such nice guys?" <laughs> oh, I know. Like I'd, I'd watch them as a young kid, and you know the the, the history between uh, between these two two nations. And I remember watching the the epic games. You know the the '95. Uh, World Cup final and, and then the, the famous uh, series victory from the All Blacks in South Africa in, in 96 and 
It was like a bloodbath. It was war, and then just and no then, rules at the ruck. I, I know, and then and then, then, then was beautiful. Then. And then to suddenly, um, you know, be playing against them, and then the hostile environments, and you know, the eye contact that I was getting from the South African four packs, like, okay, they actually they they want to kill me. And I was like, these are not nice guys, <laughs> you know. And then straight after the game, oh, how's your family? I'll oh, come have a beer, and it's like. <laughs> I've got to tell a story though about the Harker. So Stefan de Blanche is, is playing his first game against the All Blacks and Gary Tashman's the captain. He's a bit, so he goes to Gary, he says, yeah, what, what, what should I do when the, when the Harker's going? He says, no, what you got to do is you find your opponent and you lock eyes, just like Dan said, you lock eyes with him and in, your, in your, the look of your eyes, he must know that, that you are willing to die and you want him to die. It's just, it's everything. You just got to make yeah. him realize you're coming from him the whole day and you're not going away. And the more Gary's explaining this, the more trepidatious <laughs> Stefan Tablanche is becoming. So Gary says, who you, who you got tomorrow? He says, Jonah. He says, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> he says, you take my guy, Tane Randall. <laughs> There's an exception to that yeah. role. There's yeah, an exception but, when you're playing oh, Jonah. Yeah. When in England were lining it up to go out against Twickenham and, and Austin Healy was at the back and, and uh, Jonah Lewis came, stood alongside him, two teams ready to walk out. And Will, Will Greenwood says, uh, go on Austin, say it to his face. <laughs> <laughs> just, just as he was going, about to go out and play against him. He didn't do that well that day. I was watching the players come out of the tunnel there last night and I was just, it was so intense. I was just wondering what, what you guys were doing that's just mentioned in there coming out in the tunnel. Big Jamie Roberts is next to me saying, you're just in your head saying, don't look at the opposition. He said, it's, then it's a bit of a blur. I mean, coming out as, as captain, what, what are you doing in the tunnel before? It's a difficult place. It's really awkward. And that's why I was saying to, to Dan, I quite like, see his vibe, he's got a bit of a, a jig going, he's singing a little bit, he's taking a bit of the pressure off, but it is, it's really awkward. It's like you're standing there and you don't want to make eye contact, you just want to focus on the game and it, you, either you first or you, the, and you're waiting for the opposition, but it's, it's a horrible space and it's such a, horrible tension to that that, that tunnel uh, and there's such massive rigmarole you know to get the game started and that's the start of it so that, that really is a, a difficult place to be what did you because it, it does make me laugh sometimes when you know real focus and then you know a, a, a mascot comes up and then you sit and go oh hi come and have a little picture and they go right back to it I mean mentally you must be all over the place yeah, was, just before was, that game. yeah I was always pretty relaxed yeah yeah I um, you know if there's one of the players in the opposition you had a relationship with I knew that you know you could kind of you know, say hi or have a have a wee chat and you know wish them wish them luck. But then as soon as that you know first whistle went, it's okay. We're not friends anymore. So you switch on then. Yeah, yeah. I kind of. Yeah, I think it changes throughout your career as well. Like how you feel, like you know, first few caps. It's quite an intimidating place, but but then actually, you know, I used to hate the couple of hours before a game. You're just desperate, and when you get to that point, you know you're nearly there. So it's almost. Bit of excitement, especially at nine o'clock kickoff. By the way, yeah. The I mean, worst thing is that when, off nine when, when one of the oh, one terrible. of the one of the roving cameras comes and like pauses on you for a bit, you're like, <laughs> yeah, I was comfortable, but like, <laughs> <laughs> you go away now. I'm like, what are they saying about me? <laughs> now, my worst tunnel story is Juan Smith, number seven flanker, and he's yeah. a he's a grumpy. He's just born angry, you know. And he and uh, so I thought we had it. We were playing English, and it's it's quite easy to get the Afrikaans guys riled up against the English. Really? Like, I mean, I've you wouldn't noticed. have thought, yeah. Um, so I thought, no. The whole week, I thought, okay, I'm going to do my entire match prep talk in Afrikaans. You know, it's my second language, but you know, I'm pretty. I think I'm pretty well versed. So for the first time, I think about what I'm going to say. And I'm, you know, anyway, it's unra it's unraveling in the change room, and it's going pretty well. You know, when you're speaking and you're thinking, okay, this is my second language, but it's, I'm getting it. This is going really well. I pull it through, high fiving myself inside, and uh, give it. <laughs> In the circle, Boca, yes, and we're lining up. And as we're lining up, waiting for the English, Juan Smith comes from number seven, from the middle, of, all the way down to the front of the tunnel, and taps me on the shoulder and says, "Don't ever talk Afrikaans again." Just <laughs> 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 oh. shattered me, shattered me. Before. I mean, could have waited oh. until the yeah, end. Yeah, he could have. Give me some kudos. Yeah, exactly. What was because um, you've done a brilliant team talk on the pod already. What was your? T I'm trying to think what the team talk will be this Saturday. What was yours in 2007 World Cup final? What did you say? <clears throat> Finals, you and don't. Did you find the light switch? <laughs> Finals, um, it's the least you've got to do as a captain from a talking point of view. If you've got to be riling guys up for a final, you've got the That's wrong crew. Yeah. So to get to a final, you've got to, you've got a team that 
is pretty well motivated. They know what they're doing. Um, so it's really about creating the calm that, that Dan was talking about and, and not letting things escalate, you know, keeping as much calm as possible. So final was a, was a, was, was a lot of quiet time. It didn't have to get going, didn't have Ever to throw new. any brave hearts out there, no. Same for you, the 11 and 15. Would you talk in that situation? Would you be yeah, one of those? Yeah, you, you're just trying to bring people back to the, the here and now. You know, so the whole control in your mind, you know, people in a really big and um, important game like a, a World Cup playoff game or a final, it's hard not to think about, you know, the outcome, the result, or, geez, I hope we win this week. And, and you forget about the, in the process. What do you need to do now? We, we learnt the hard way um, through the, uh, the haka. So we obviously we perform the haka and we get really sort of emotional around that and then we'd start the game and we'd give like six or seven penalties in the first 15 minutes because we hadn't, you know, reset and focus on what we we need to do and remind ourselves of the game plan. So you'll see the guys now perform the haka, they'll walk back, they'll connect, they'll remind themselves to, to breathe, to just kind of bring their, their their heart rate down a little bit and then focus, okay. And then you'll see the likes of, you know, Richie Moanga going, okay, it's our kickoff, I'm going to kick to this position, I need you guys chasing, just to bring them into a really task so focus. there's nothing emotional at this point? No, it's purely this is it. what we're doing. Yeah, it needs to be really task focused. What do you need to do right now? Nail that, then nail the next task. And it's all about sort of controlling your mind in, in those moments and, and bringing the players back to the, the process because it's far too easy to focus on, on the outcome. I don't know if you noticed this, but um, as uh, DC started talking then, the sun came out in the clouds. <laughs> oh, no. Is that a sign? Spot, right? Is that a sign? <laughs> and he looks great. Thank you. So I'm like, I'd like Ben squinting yeah. in the corner. Yeah, it's, What's he it's saying? Hurting. What's hurting. he saying? Um, were, were you one of those voices in, in, in that yeah, chamber? Well, what John said, John said it is really pertinent because there's a danger that the nervous energy comes out in idle chat that means nothing. And, and some captains that you almost feel that they're saying it for their own benefit because they need to say something. And, and um, you know, Martin Johnson, 03, like we usually, he didn't say, he was really good at knowing when something needed saying and when actually the boys were there, exactly what John said. So usually you'd get to the tunnel just before you ran out and big game, John would look over your shoulder, not saying anything Churchillian, but you know, it, it just get the mood right and say the right thing. And World Cup final 03, he looks around and just runs off. And, and we all got the message, but obviously spoke to him afterwards. And he said, well, I turned around. What was I going to say that was going to make a blind bit of difference? So mm -hmm. I could see it in everyone's eyes that they were there. If I'd said anything, it, it was for my own benefit. 2007, slightly different team. We'd, we'd sort of had a difficult journey there. I remember Phil Vickery, really, really good in the changing room beforehand. And, and he sort of tried to bring it more down to a personal level. Because as soon as we started getting through the knockout stages, everything was about making England proud. And he just changed it to, you know, there's a, there's a few people that you've given your, your free tickets to out there that have given up an awful lot for you yeah. to be here and, and make it about them, not the 80,000 other people. And just make, just gave it a bit of a personal edge to it. Didn't work, nice. but, <laughs> didn't win, but he's, um, but yeah. Andre Pollard, obviously player of the match uh, against uh, England. Then I saw you pop up with Georgie Barrett, giving him the MasterCard player of the match against Argentina. He was brilliant, wasn't he? Absolutely brilliant players and and uh, and really nice guys. So, you know, I was like, lucky enough to, to present the, you know, the MasterCard player of the match uh, to Geordie and sort of congratulate him. And, you know, it's, it's a pretty special um, you know, thing to, to be able to, to give someone. Uh, obviously in a team environment, you know, how do you pick uh, one person out of uh, a winning team, but but Jordy, he, he deserved it, and um, you know the, the work the Mastercard's gone into uh, these player of the the match trophies is, is pretty incredible. So what they do, they have a, a studio um, in Paris where they take uh, a soundtrack. You know, it might it be parts of the crowd uh, cheering, parts of the the impact, the collisions, the the singing, the the referee whistle, whatever it is. So. Each player of the match uh, trophy is is unique to that game, um, and obviously you can can hear that that soundtrack. So Geordie will be, you know, mm. listening to to that soundtrack. That was, you know, I, I bring back a lot of fond memories of that, that semi final. I like the fact as well. It's not just on the pitch too. You know, it's the awareness of, of the bigger game. It's the mental capacity. I'd imagine to be in that moment, you know, to be doing something that like that is brilliant, isn't it? Uh, all right, we're moving on to our camp high fifteen. This is all about uh, saying cheers. Who you like to have a beer with after the game? Maybe it's someone you did play with, someone it's uh, you never got to play with. It doesn't matter. Uh, this is in association with um, Asahi Super Dry. 
it's been lovely. There's been some really good stories coming out of it. So it can be anyone you like, past or present. Uh, <laughs> just talking about South Africans there, like, you know, hard on the pitch, but great to have a beer after. Can't wait to hear you've got, Ben, who's in your camp by 15. Um, so there's a couple. Um, I remember actually 2003 World Cup when we beat South Africa in the pool stages and Victor Matfield came and found me afterwards. I'd actually... <laughs> so South Africa... Um, for that game had um, we picked up a couple of their line out calls on the video I always did like the old VHS I'd go back and forwards and I'd, Wait, I'd try this, and get is this the language thing is that what yeah you so every, everyone said you learn Afrikaans like uh, I, I learned to count to 10 in Afrikaans go now, on for most forwards go on counting to 10 in any language is, is, a, <laughs> is a thing anyway but um, <laughs> basically what we what we figured out was that they'd basically just gone right one's the front <laughs> in Afrikaans so <laughs> I sort of beat Victor there. It's the only time you need a, you, I you had that success. Okay, make it more complicated. <laughs> to me, it's the only time I had any success against Victor. He came up and, and found me with a beer after the after the game. But probably the one that that stands out for making my life hell on the pitch because um, he was horrible to play against in a fun way um, was Ali Williams. And then going out afterwards and having a beer with him was exactly, it's not the, one beer. was, was it's exactly not one beer. the same it's a roller coaster yeah. horrible but a lot of fun <laughs> and, uh, yeah so uh, yeah. i had a, a a good few battles with, with ali and, and um talking about the hacker you know I, you, you find you go opposite your opposite number and and it was good for me because doing the hacker ali's probably the least threatening <laughs> bloke because he doesn't look like he's made to do to do the war dance so uh, but yeah, he, he was the guy that I used to used to seek out for a beer afterwards. You should have seen him uh, rock up to uh, the stadium on Saturday in his big coat and like, just loving life. Every, like, all the selfies in the world. Does that sound familiar to you with Ali? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Even the hacker, it was more about him. Uh, <laughs> he'd be out on the side, kind of a couple of meters away from anyone else. He's obviously a very close friend uh, of mine. He's so a I brilliant can say things like that. He's, yeah. he's uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of great stories with, with Ali. And, you know, when Ben's talking about him, I, I knew it. It's not one beer uh, with Ali. It's 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 a nightfall. So uh, he's a top man. Obviously uh, contributed a lot to the you know the, the All Black culture and uh, the legacy. So yeah, it's, uh, it was awesome to, right. to see him over here in France. Um, who does Dan Carter put in his uh, camp by fifteen? Oh geez, uh, so I, I I love you know going to to war with your brothers. And my favourite time of the week is when you're sitting in the changing room with your team uh, before all the media. Uh, before the families come in and you, you know you're having a beer with one of your teammates and as a young teenager um, and we've already talked about him on this podcast uh, today uh, that I used to look up to and for me changed the game of rugby is Jonah Lomu as uh, he was a hero uh, of mine through my teenage years and then my first ever professional game Canterbury against Wellington uh, I was a young 20 year old and um, Jonah was on the bench for some reason he came on and I was like oh no here we go. And as a little number 10, uh, Wellington had a scrum on the right-hand side. And Jean, Jonah came off his wing, got the ball off the nine, and just eyeballed me. I'm like, I kind of want this, but I kind of don't. Anyway, steamrolled me. Um, I felt exactly like Mike Cat felt in uh, 95 and got steamrolled. He went in to, to score a try. Um, unfortunately, he had you know, some, some illness um, after the, that year, so I never got to play with them, uh, which... Um, you know, I, I, if I could choose anyone to, to play with and go to, to war and play a test match with, it would, it would be Jonah. I would love nothing more than putting a cross kick across, across to him or setting him up for a try or even just sitting back and, you know, in a cup of tea as he runs over uh, the opposition and then to, you know, enjoy his company in that changing room environment after a game uh, would have been a, you know, a dream come true for me. It's been um, amazing, actually. He's come up once or twice, obviously. And uh, during the pod, when someone's talking about him, you know, other esteemed rugby playing guests have turned around, you know, scalp um, Brits the other day was, tell me more. Like, even current and past players always wanted to know more about Jono, more than anyone else, maybe. Oh, you, you know, so we have a big ethos in, in the All Black environment. Uh, no individual's, you know, greater than the team, but, you know, he's, he's a freak. He was greater than the team. Yeah. But you wouldn't know by the the way that he always put the right. team first. He was such a team man. Is um, you know, I'm getting stories from, you know, my, my Wellington uh, teammates or, you know, Crusaders teammates that played with him at, at All Black level. And he was just 
the most kindest, caring, um, you know, person. He, he obviously, you know, had a, a lot of success uh, on and, and off the field, but he was always, you know, story sort of Ma Nonu had just started playing him in 2002 and he kind of looked up to Jonah and Jonah took him under his wing and just gave him one of his cars. He go, it's, it's yours, uh, just gave it to him, you know, because he was just, you know, so caring and, and wanted to, you know, help and support the people around him. It was, it was never about him. Uh, it was always putting other people first. Love that. Put some pressure on you now, I? Yeah. I, well, in fairness, I also got steamrolled by Jonah. Yeah. Canes versus Sharks in the, in the cake tin and Butchie's kicking off. I said, Butchie, don't go deep. Don't kick it on Jonah. He kicks it straight down Jonah's <laughs> throat. And he's coming, at, he's coming at me from a kickoff. He's now got a head of steam. And I'm thinking, like, he's definitely going to step into like a smaller flanker or a backline player. He's, he came straight at me. And I realized that I needed to commit. And I committed a little bit high. But I reckon three somersaults backwards. And I looked up and he was on the halfway line with two of our guys still on his back. So yeah, he was some player. Uh, my <laughs> guy is probably one of the, my best mates in the game, post the game. But he was the most annoying little prick you've ever seen <laughs> honestly George Gregan yeah. he, he was just next level like in the ear all the time and obviously I've I kept never heard him being described as that <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing about prick. the start of our relationship is I was captain he was captain and, and that's so he always used to have these comments and get in the ref's ear and I, and I I sort of had to learn how to sort of get you know get into the ref because of this guy you know and he was always the ref and he was just smart and he had these little chirps and you'd just sort of have have your, your your hands on your knees and say you tired big boy and then you walk past you know and it was just irritating I mean I, we had this one altercation uh, um, with the ref both of us were getting to the ref and the referee was getting more and more worked up and he's, the ref says he says guys yeah. There's only one referee. It feels like there's three. And Greg and Chirp type says, yeah, and you're not in the top three, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you had the gift of the I, could, I couldn't respond to that. Um, and then we awesome. started to get to know each other um, through the Mandela Cup, and we'd have to have this photo shoot on the Friday, and I would dread it, and you know, awkward hello. And, and one day he said, oh, I've got this coffee shop. You want to go for a coffee? I was like, okay. I didn't really want to. And sat down, got to know him, played the North-South game mm -hmm. with each other. And sitting on the bus and that, we guys said, you know, George, it's been a difficult emotional journey for me with you because you know, I, I really did dislike you. It wasn't a date, John. It, 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 it felt like it. And, um, and I said, but you are, he is just such a top man. He's just he is smart, boy. funny, unbelievable competitor. He's got to be a vampire. He hasn't aged a day. He looks yeah, the same yeah. now yeah. as he did when he won the World Cup. And so he's just a top man, but he really, he was an unbelievably annoying guy to play against. They never ever found a shirt to fit him either, did they? That was mm. the most surprising thing. <laughs> <engine. laughs> so way too big for him for about 10 years. Great, great um, guy off the field. Though. Yeah. Like, you know, even, you know, 2003, we were obviously watching the other semi-final. And I don't think there's ever been a better sledge than four more years, boys. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Particularly for those front row boys that they're, they're bound. They can't even swing at him. Uh, just timing perfect. All right, I'm going to finish on two technicals here. Uh, how did New Zealand beat South Africa at the weekend? Uh, for, for me, they, they have to, to match them physically. Um, and that starts at the, the set piece. Uh, so scrum, line out and, and break down. They, they just need to match them there. Take their opportunities. And in a World Cup final, you're not going to get many opportunities. It's going to come down to, to one or two moments. If they can uh, be as accurate and, and clinical as they have been uh, with, with ball in hand over the last couple of weeks, then and, and they take those moments, then you know, that's, that's a, a good start to, to getting over. Uh, against a strong box side. How do South Africa beat New Zealand on Saturday? I think the worry is it's been you know, two really big weekends, quarterfinals and semifinals. This turnaround, the, the recovery of this week will be a big part of, 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 of how they can match up to New Zealand. New Zealand, with all due respect, had a pretty soft semifinal weekend so and an extra day. So South Africa must be pretty beat up today physically. and. Um, and, and everyone wants to match South Africa physically, and it'll 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 be about how how they can take that physicality after what they've put their bodies through, and and the intensity of the clashes that they've had, um, and they've had some big clashes over the sort of seven week eight eight week period. So it'll be around recovery and about how how much how high they can get to after. I guess the mileage that's on the car at the moment in terms of the, 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 the intensity of the games and the, and the level at which they've been playing is sort of, that engine's been revving at seven, 8,000 revs. Can it continue for another week? And that's what they've got to focus on this week. 
Who's going to win the World Cup final, Ben? So before the tournament, I obviously thought France were the favourites. I thought South Africa uh, were, were the second favourites. Uh, I probably think New Zealand are favourites to win this now. And, and for the reasons that John's just said, just that ability to go again. And, and if they are going to win, they have to dominate physically. I, th I think technically, I think where the All Blacks would win it is not necessarily in the wide expanses, but it's giving the time for that because... The line speed of South Africa is so threatening that if the likes of Ardi Surveyor can wriggle in the contact, make, make a couple of extra metres and get those big South African forwards having to backtrack before, before they come forward again defensively, New Zealand will have the room to go round them. And, and if they have that, New Zealand, I think, will win the game. But they need the forwards just to give them an extra metre in contact just to win those small, tiny battles that will make all the difference. And, and if that happens, I can see New Zealand winning. But look, I, I'm not betting any money on it. <laughs> I couldn't tell you. It's been amazing, hasn't it? It's yeah. been such a good World Cup and it's going to be a fantastic final, I'm sure. Ben, Dan, John, thank you so much. Thank Brilliant. you. Thank you. Good luck, Dan. <laughs> You've been listening to the official Rugby World Cup podcast brought to you by Super Superdrive. Please leave your comments and make sure you share the pod below.